today we will listen to one of the popular teacher and scholar on these approaches who will speak on discerning the aham puram intimacies of intertextuality challenges in translating literary texts and he is our esteemed professor of english dr a s dasan we welcome you sir let's give a big applause for professor a s dasan dr dasan is a professor of english served the department of pg studies in english university of mysore as a professor and as a chairman and founder director of the center for proficiency development and placement services university of mysore he is a scholar of multi dimensional insights committed to critical literary and holistic education author of three books five monographs and you know many uh, national and international papers to his credit uh, we can cite you know some of his noteworthy popular writings the rains and the roots the indian english novel then and now and his uh, essays on intertextuality as a metaphor then relational striving in hermeneutics my friends you must be you know happy you may also you know get knowledge on hermeneutics and historicizing reading dasan had also delivered the first mulkraj anand memorial lecture at india international center new delhi currently he serves as the director of sukhruda academy mysore this academy is a proficiency focused and technology savvy hub for promoting critical literacy through formal and non formal education we we'll learn a lot from professor dasan and i think most of you must be familiar with professor dasan sir for accepting our invitation now i would like to request professor dasan to begin his lecture thank you thank you aditya panda and winston manjula around me to help me and my lady professor nalini dasan is also around very good evening to all of you and you can see the visual there silvanu or malai vanakkam i am contextualizing this visual from a visual i received from uti a friend of mine just yesterday morning with or kaalai vanakkam from uti and this is a badaga community background picture so beautifully drawn done and i thought i will put it across to you in a kind of transliteration mm -hmm. to greet you all from my soul on behalf of ntm cal and other colleagues here next the mind tree that you see here in the next slide yes yeah that is my mind tree is also the mind tree of dr abdul kalam if you have seen his website billion hearts you will see this as one of the emblems and this for me represents signifies a first seat of intertextuality and the polyphony and that is the basis of my lecture today when we deal with the translation endeavors we look at a sideward glancing in terms of interstitiality multi textuality multi locality and the polyphony these are all fine terms that we hear in theory today vis a vis julia kristava bakhtin 
a number of other along with the other famous terms from J by Jameson historicizing the context in which we do a work of art either in terms of original writing or translating it from source text to target language next in the next slide you see how we we developed this idea of the classical canon of mimesis aristotle with reference to aristotle my slide next slide ah uh, thank you and this gives us an idea how the traditional way of looking at literature hermeneutics was prevailing mimesis is a kind of imitation with a number of poetic plausibilities to note it against the brutalities of life that is time and history and the poetic plausibilities are supernatural beauties that in no will human existence by a catharsis as aristotle would say and later arnold insisted eliot and others to practice that kind of poetry and that kind of poetic next slide it is today for us vis-a-vis -vis translation interpretation as such are doing any hermeneutical activity including translation we have to keep this challenges in mind what are they number one we live in an age of post modernism where this continuity disruption this location decentering indeterminacy anti totalization incredulity towards master or meta narratives prevail as new canonical indian this is post modernism this is post structuralism we like to go to rolambar and go to derida and number of other people who have followed this this new canon there are attempts today to problematize ethical perspectives in literature with a predilection towards preferring the demise of positivism this is a very serious problem and the humanism and promoting reading as if it were like a peeling an onion as if writing or reading or even translation had nothing to do with the world in the next slide this is what is under attack in the name of post structuralism or post modernism narratives of bourgeois liberalism fixity of meaning universal message codes are under attack and these are all can be these can be seen as attempts to challenge the empiricist rationalist humanist assumption of cultural systems including those of arts and science to put it in other words a more simpler form monologic reading is a critique as an essentialist reading that does not go beyond the message code of fixity of meaning and therefore the importance given to intertextuality and the polyphony look at what do you see on the picture in the next slide a yeah, visual probably you all can guess and tell me what it is a 
am i audible this is a ship in the sea waters and this is what the headline in the independent the british morning newspaper reflected after what happened to the ship next slide look at this built in spain owned by a norwegian registered in cyprus managed from glasgow chartered by the french crewed by russian flying a liberian flag carrying an american cargo pouring oil and pouring oil onto the welsh coast this is the headline report in the independent on 22nd february 1996 what does it convey to us no more monological reading no more monological rereading as it makes little sense in today's world a polyphony which is a way forward to interpret or do translation look at the next slide and this is quite interesting is not only polyphony is also decentering the self decentering the center deconstructing the center and this is what is happening is happening today in hermeneutic and the theory and this is very important for us to know for us as translators to know what's happening around in terms of theory now read this visual plus the writing on the side from the top if you are to be physically with me around me in a classroom context you will enjoy what i am going to say and you will also see what a beauty that is contained in this the other way of reading look at start from the first top is the conversation between a lover and the fiance he starts yes at last it was so hard to wait do you want me to leave she is asking no don't even think about it do you love me Yeah, of course over and over have you ever cheated on me no will you kiss me every chance i get will you hit me are you crazy i am not that kind of person can i trust you yes my dear oh darling now read it from the now keep the previous slide read it from the bottom look at the other way of reading darling yes can i trust you are you crazy i am not that kind of person will you hit me every chance i get will you kiss me no why are you even asking have you ever cheated on me of course over and over do you love me no don't even think about it do you want me to leave yes at last it was so hard to wait this is a decentered reading where the conflict is between male and female self and the other center and the periphery today periphery needs to be articulated and hence this reading from the bottom look at the next slide what is happening this is peter barry in his famous book beginning theory and this is the crux of the whole book politics is pervasive language is constitutive truth is provisional meaning is contingent human nature is a myth this sums up the 
kind of post structuralist deconstructed reading of works of art or even translated texts or even when we do translation from the original text to the target text next here you see a brief chronology of in terms of the historiography of hermeneutics from the antique classic greek antiquity to the roman to the augustinian medieval period the reformation and then to the romantics and then to the middle 19th century then the emergence of karl marx friedrich engels freud and others the late 19th century early middle 20th century where beyond the freud we think to just then heidegger sars others came into the picture and in the mid of late 20th century we have roman jacobson louis strauss rolambard lacan all others came in and later marxists also emerged althusa puko derida to some extent though not a marxist and then in the next slide you see the genealogies and the relationship and this is the way intertextuality spreads polyphony grows and connectivity goes on in terms of sideward glancing to use the phrase of uh, of bhakti or relational striving to use the phrase of max all these are very important for us to keep in mind when we do any translation endeavor in terms of literature next you have another slide where i am summing up all this in terms of readers approach the reader today is a rare species impacted by theory she sees the immense potentiality of language number one word as a sign the signified in the content the text complicated by utterances as it is in the book of job for instance as it is in arkan orion some of the books with number of variants and differences coming in between utterances and our own indic tradition of six blind men searching for the the elephant the parts of elephant is a beautiful example of that kind of what is called vakrokti tradition of looking at the text the reader is able to see the text as a boundless entity because other texts and discourses include i mean the printed line this is a very important point for us point of order to be reminded when we do translation work instead of sticking on to traditional labyrinth a fixed universal literary hermeneutic circle are today giving way to a set of new universals which come in the form of new idioms canons and chronotopes in terms of time and space categories and that i summarize in the light of my reading of bhakti one temporalization i call historicizing intertextuality which is renamed as interstitiality interconnectedness consorting together dialogism acknowledging differences polyphony and heteroglossia that is to celebrate manifold voices and not oneness or twoness or threeness but meaningless that's the beauty of polyphony today it is against this drop backdrop i am bringing julia kristeva here who brilliantly quotes this summarizes this kind of post modern reading today authors she says do not create their text from their own mind but rather compile them from pre existing text 
this is the source of intertextuality text as a core text the text becomes a permutation of text and intertextuality in the space of a given text in which several utterances taken from other texts intersect and neutralize one another that's the beauty of a text seen viewed as a core text therefore the text is not an individual isolated object but a compilation of cultural textuality this is julia Now see the relevance of Bakhtin. Bakhtin, though he was a contemporary 1920s in Russia, excelled many times. But who became so popular across the world, outside Russia particularly, in the post-1970 thinking, in terms of theory and hermeneutics. And this is what he says. Existence is a dialogue. To be human is to dialogue. To exist itself is to dialogue. The moment you are born, the moment you are out of the womb of the mother, you are you are born to dialogue. Therefore, to live is to dialogue. Our whole body is involved in the process of dialoguing. Therefore, truth is not born or to be found inside the head of an individual person in an islanded consciousness. It is born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of dialogic imagination, dialogic interaction, dialogic consorting. This is Bhakti. Read his book, The Dialogic Imagination. Brilliant, brilliant. This paves way for the, the, the new canons, heteroglossia, polyphony, and relational striving. I'll come to that a little later. Next. What is relational striving? It implies an osmotic process. Mosis is a science term, scientific term, often used in botany, biology more, and today it is even used in psychology, and we are deriving all this even to the hermeneutical circles today in literature and the criticism. It involves a spontaneous centripetal, centrifugal movement tending towards a synthesis of higher value. This is what molecules do in science and biology. From lower concentration to higher concentration and vice versa. And this is what happens when uh, mummy cooks, when mummy, mother prepares for idli at home, grinding. In the grinding you see the two movements simultaneously going together, centripetal and centrifugal. Something going in something coming out and ultimately taking out for fermentation, deafening, and then making it pakka to be prepared for a nice idli to come out. This is the process that I'm indicating. Such a process happens in science, psychology, and metaphorically even in the art of literary work, writing, and hermeneutic circle. It is a diachronic, diachronic is sideward glancing. Vakrokti tradition of Kuntaka in Indic tradition. Synchronic, ultimately converging together. Whether Gwani or Vakrokti, always ultimately there is a convergence towards synthesis. And this is a synchronic agency in that sense that navigates the process of hermeneutics today. It is inescapable, inescapable medium. In the era of heteroglossia and polyphony, through which human discourses are proceeded towards what I call pluri-signifying sideward glancing, to use the phrase of Bhakti. Next. 
and this is the indic tradition in the indic tradition if you go to madurai i i come from madurai i hail from madurai if you go to that famous minakshi temple you have this symbolism pancha sabai the five courts of the shrine in the minakshi amman temple they stand as a collective witness to the cordial relationship between shaivism vaishnavism and sattism the dance postures may be linked with the indic canons of reading interpreting which accommodate the possibilities and plausibilities of twists and curves as indicated by in vakrokti by kuntaka or by indirection and connotation as enunciated by anandavardhana in dwanyada and the celebration of multi layers of meaning meaning making as a shared and polyphonic accomplishment this i learned better from professor cd narsimhya of dwanya loka located in mysore who was a guru to many of us during his sojourn on earth and who taught us the art of looking at from cross word ways next to go back again to the shiva myth and this is samhita army in the hindu she wrote a few years ago this is another legacy of balancing arrive in synthesis if you go to madurai meenakshi amman temple it is only meenakshi marriage we see an episode signifying the female dominance if you go to chidambaram you see chidambaram marriage where it is shown as an encounter suggesting the opposite the male dominance nataraja shiva and if you go to trichangodu you see the ardhanari marriage where shiva appears as half male and half female as an instance connoting the equal balance of power between shiva and and meenakshi this is beautiful way of looking at the indic way of looking at a middle path which we need to teach to the west or which the west have to learn from us even eliot even derrida number of modernists post modernists have learned from indic tradition these values which are behind their post structuralist or structuralist or post modernist trends unfortunately they are not able to see the synthesis because they see rupture today as a happening across the globe and therefore they see deconstruction is the only way killing humanism killing positivism is the only way of looking at literature which we don't have to agree which i don't subscribe to look at the next one this is the beauty of tamil identity yadum ure yavarum keli this is our podumai tanmai this is our podumai ullam podumai ullam in the united nations at the unesco this is written in japan one of the universities is beautifully inscribed on a plaque the same tamil poem this version in appearing in pranaluru circa around 500 bc what is this what does it mean to us all towns are one all men are our kin our pains and pains relief are from within thus we have seen the vision of the wise and this is what beautifully is articulated in the in the in one of the poems in pranano he tamilians as interpreters as the translators as readers of literature as people who are conscious about what's happening in hermetic circle we are a trans state people with the broadest outlook as broad as the sky as long as the sea as infinite as the ocean broadest outlook with 
what you what we call aham puram chronotopic intimacies guiding our journeys literary journeys our world vision our world view our interpretation of the world in relation to the world in the ambience of intertitiality this is what i call it cosmopolitanism collaboration of many men next so <coughs> this is further expanded in our legacy we call god ekam anegam one god but understood in many ways grasped as many ways as possible in as many ways as possible ekam anegam iraivan adi valga and look at the other way of particularity and universal going together cannot do a shivane poetry this is shiva tradition yen not overcome iraiva poetry yen not overcome iraivan then not overcome shivan this is our manina yet in this differences variation divergences what is our quest search and stand by truth truth alone triumphs this is a mantra from muntaka upanishad adapted as our national motto in 1950 next this is again tamil tradition naam yaakum kudiyallo namanuk kanjo netrikkan kaatinum kutram kutrame this is nakir nakir kadai sangakala poet so brilliantly because a poet laureate in the chola kingdom of lothangal even if god will come and say that untruth is truth we will stand against and say netrikkan trapinam even if the third eye of shiva opens we shall stand by truth and truth alone will find this is why to celebrate this meaningless polyphony we have three words in tamil for truth vai mai nei mai un mai all connote ul nokku parvai ullathil uraindu kedakum ul nokku ul nokku parvai ullathil ul nokku parvayil kutram endru paduvai veliyilum anjaadu vilambida vendum vilambida vendum adhu dhaan unmai that is the meaning of nakirans kutram kutram unity of thought word soul expression and action clear this defines our tamil identity manida valgu thudu what is that manida valgu thudu tamilan endror inam undu taniye avar kor gunam undu this is the beauty and that taniyor taniye avar kor gunam is a sign of that celebration of not only oneness but manyness next therefore what is the thrust and focus of this first part that has gone just now discern appreciate the intertextual dimensions of agam puram intimacy intertwined in literary truth so as to have a holistic grasp of the challenges involved in translating literary text and the reading translated text the crux of this lecture lies in its emphasis on historicizing temporalizing that is bhakti time and category coming together as chronotopes creating ushering in cortex to read the cortex as a uh, text as cortex with the sole aim of perceiving truth truth what is said and 
how it is said. That is translation. That is the crux of translation. What is stated in the original and how it is stated beautifully, artistically in the original. That has to be translated with the context of the local targeted reader. Therefore, we ask for historicizing. Therefore, I plead for historicizing because historicizing facilitates readers to bring in and bring out a number of cortex in terms of manliness, in terms of interstitial dimension. Next. This is the second part of the lecture. And this is the thesis of mine. This is the thesis of all my professional articulations across India, across other continents, whenever, wherever I go for lecture. Reading, like writing, is historicizing. You can change it. Translating, like reading, is historicizing. Historicizing is a temporalizing. Temporalizing is a relational striving towards meaning making that prospers, that propels readers to construe and construct reading as a contemporaneous act. This is Eliot in Wasteland as a contemporaneous act that locates the text in the continuum of time and space. This is Bhakti. This is why when you listen to me, you will see a number of core texts coming in from different eras of literature, from different timings and contexts of literature, from different authors and critics coming in. And this is why you need to be aware of a holistic reading needed, required for all of us to come in. Continuum. This is the contemporaneity that I'm speaking of. This is what Eliot speaks in Tradition and Individual Talent, the famous essay of his. Tradition and implies relationality. Relationality points to interstitiality, the presence of various sites. This is what Sangam, Agampuram, Affinities, relationality is so beautifully done in Sangam literature. Interstitiality entails chronotopic, dialogic, sideward glancing towards meaning making. I, I, I love to explain in a classroom context, but time is short and we are in online. I don't know what you are all doing, listening, half listening, we don't know. But this is all I can do right now in, in the limited space of online virtual lecture. For translators, this positionality can serve as a springboard as we learn the art of translating literary text or reading translated text. Translating is a rereading, therefore, the ST, the source text, with the aim of relocating the same in the milieu, moment, race, context of the target language. It's a way of inculturating, enculturating. This is the this is a new term I'm using. Enculturating the ST into the culture of the target reader. Now we come to the Agampuram as a chronotope towards inculturation in translation. In Tamil literature, Agampuram affinities, the inner circle and the outer circle. That's the meaning of Agam and Puram. Agam the inner and the Puram the outer. Serve as a chronotopic metaphors for contextualization and inclusivity. Agam deals with the aspects of love as a human experience. At the individual level between the lover and the fiancé, the Talaiman and Talaivi, in terms of Kadal, Oodal, Koodal, and Tudu, Tudu through the messenger. You will see an example coming later. Puram, the outer circle speaks about the affairs of a person in a community, in a socio-political context, including socio-economic condition, character, generosity, war, heroism, all such beautiful things can come into the picture. Next. And this is a Sangam age. Second century to third century AD. It's a great period of outpourings in terms of Tolgapiyam. One of the finest treatises still available to us on grammar and poetics written at this time, 
wherein Sangam quite beautifully defines Agam and tradi Puram tradition. A poem according to Tulgapiyam either lies in the inner space of love, relationship, feelings, or in the public realm of kings, war, heroism, and community. Agam and the Aham poems are poems of the interior group from the, in, the four landscapes of Tamil country. This is what we call Tinaigal. Tinaigal in Tamil. Mountain region, Kurunji. Forest lands, Mullai. Agricultural lands around the river basins, Margam. Coastal region, Naidal. We don't have far, uh, deserts in Tamil Nadu. And the parks, hill slopes of forest, Palai. Palai is a desert. Though we don't have desert, but when there is drought, that is considered as as polite as as uh, as uh, and, and the and desert. Each of these landscapes, with their gods, the plants, animals, the tribes, or people, they all serve as context, context, and context in terms of original text, articulate. Watering holes, drums, music became a rich cluster of images and symbols. Metaphors vis a vis Puram. This exterior landscape, a map, map and feeling associated with the face of love. This can happen only in Tamil. Only in Tamil language as a classic language. Somewhat, maybe in Sanskrit too. Some of the South Indian languages too. But this is the beauty. There's a whole world of signifiers in the outer landscape. And various living forms, cultural codes signify specific human feelings. This is connotation. Look at the next one. The Agam from intimacies of intellectuality in Sangam classics. Eight anthologies, which you call Ettu Ettu Thogai. Nakhinai, Nalla Kurundagai, Aimuru Nooru, Otta Padittu Pattu, Ong Paribadam, Katarindar, Yetum, Kaliodu, Agam Puram, Indru, Itiratta Etu Tokai. My Tamil is a little gone because I have been away from Tamil Nadu for years, except periodic visiting or lectures or home visits. They consist of 2,371 poems. I am speaking of the eight anthology, varying from small stanzas of three lines. In Ayyuguru Nuru, to stanzas of 40 lines in Puradanuru, written by 470 poets, including 27 women poetesses, known either by their proper names or casual names, some unidentified authors from different parts of Tamil Nadu, from divergent professions. Arabindo said, Authorless poet. A great poem writes itself. The author is insignificant. He is merged into this, into the anonymity. Where is individuality doesn't matter because God inspires the poem. Therefore, God is the author. Therefore, some of the authors never decide, never opted to divulge their name. Unidentified authors. Beauty. More about this you can read in C.R. Krishna. Tamil literature through the ages, a social cultural perspective, published in 1998. It's also available in Marabu website. You can note down Marabu website at tamilnation.org. You will get plenty of reading in that. Now, what is this Agam? Of the eight anthologies, next. Five are Agam, two on Puram, and one on both. Six of them are in Agaval meter. Agaval meter is like similar to blank word. Blank verse is most suitable for expression of human feelings. This is how romantic poets opted for blank verse, including Wordsworth, Shelley, even Tennyson too. And our Sangam poets, they loved this Agaral blank verse modes of communication. Conducive medium to communicate spontaneously human feelings, emotiveness. In many of these poems, the original Tamil language runs like a river long word with the rapid rolling rhythms, accumulation of syllables and communicating the artistic feel of human experience. A general harmony 
provides in spite of the differences throughout these eight ontologies that is the synthesis that is the synthesis the tone and the temper of the age is beautifully reflected this is the cortex this is historicized and this you can read more about from L. Hart and Hank Hayspitz, Columbia University Press, PC. 400 songs of war and wisdom, English translation of Pranam. Beautiful. And of course, other familiar sources, A.K. Ramanujam, of whom I will come back to later. Tamil Sangam poetry translation. And then Dr. Murugan, B. Murugan, Kalitohai, he has translated that in English. Beautiful, you can read that. Next, the third part of this lecture, and this is the core of this beneficial to you as prospective translator. I am looking at A.K. Ramanujan in the light of what I have explained just now in the, in the last half an hour. How he became a translator in tune with the Aham Pram tradition. A poet, philologist, folklorist, translator, playwright, A.K.R. wrote widely on a number of genres spanning across disciplines. He was well versed in five languages, English, Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, Sanskrit, and also a bit of Malayalam too. His theoretical and aesthetic assimilations and articulations vis-a-vis -vis translations argued for non-standardized dialectics. One, two, Context sensitive pragmatic hermeneutics. This is what you translators should develop. And the sensibilities, and above all, three localized aesthetics. Localized is the combination of the local and the global. Both combined together, shortened together, they become global. Aesthetics espousing at the same time a cosmopolitan approach to translation theory and practice. This is information, a.k.a. Ramanujan. Ramanujan's approach to translation may be viewed as a bridge-making endeavor between abstractions and experience. This, the West is not capable of. So as to discern the affinities between Agam, the interior, and the Puram, vis-a-vis -vis intertextuality. Of course, he was a master storyteller. He was always in search of an audience across the discipline. This way he has got more admirers, or equal admirers in other disciplines too, beyond literature, original literature or English literature. That's because the man moved away to America, traveled across the world as a young man, leaving Mysore, his hometown, from where he, he picked up all this, the Indian tradition from the business. The sagacity with which he tells every story, be it through his poems or translated texts of folk tale, not only delights us, readers across disciplines, but also inspires us to look at him as an Akshay Patra, with the fullness of the part never getting emptied, to go to court. Grish Karnad, a friend of Dr. Uh, of A.K. Ramanujan. Look at this translation of A.K.M. This is from original Sanskrit to English, English to Kannada. Ullavaru. Look at the alge algebraic precision. Shivalaya Madhuvavaru. The rich will make temples for Shiva. Nani Anu Madali, Padavanaya, what shall I, a poor man? This is the English translation of the Kannada poem by A.K. For more than 40 years, he was, he pursued resolutely, vibrantly, as a multifaceted carrier, he practiced this as a pragmatic formalist linguist, practicing translator, insightful folklorist, involved ethnographer, 
intermittent novel writer playwright pursuing all these careers simultaneously almost like his full time preoccupation he wrote books on classical and modern literature convincingly argued for as i said earlier for non standardized dialectics and the pragmatic hermeneutics from this point of view he strengthens the contribution towards cosmopolitan approach to translation theory and practices of inventive dialectics next next ekar neither subscribed to nor restricted to the post colonial term this is the beauty of how he deviated from the post colonial or even post modernist or post structuralist stance he was not overwhelmingly attracted by this theory the post colonial turn turn either as an ideological movement meaning political act that includes the resistance and transformation against colonial or hegemonic schema or as a temporal marker meaning periodicity it was neither a post colonial ideology in the sense as espoused by henry louis gates or guy or gayatri spivak or homi baba now he belonged to the stefanian group of diasporic and post colonial writers like sukhitaru and others his storytelling or theory or practice of translation did not focus on examining the relationships between language and power across cultural boundaries or redefining the meanings of cultural ethnic identity ideology or post colonial discoursing was not his forte next therefore what is his approach his approach to translation was a conscious perennial quest for bridge making between abstractions and experience this i have already explained the selection of the next the poem from devar krotho's lyric love lyric from kurundogai of tamil sangam poetry which he has translated will indicate the interior landscape and the agamram dimensions he brings in so beautifully in translation in full fidelity to the original text next they connect readers with his perennial quest for discerning the intimacies the intimacies of intertextuality in terms of what i call aesthetic heterodox in terms of linguistic and semiotic semantic category the interior ragam the exterior puram and the visual the aural forms which vinay davarkar comment cumulatively bring together an unparalleled variety of languages and texts genre literature historical periods and past and present to put it together and that's what his translated works stand upon go to the next slide go to the next one go to the next one yeah the intertextual matrices that that he brings in they all connote cosmopolitanism the sublime the earthly the outstanding and the ordinary the poetic and the prosaic the tentative and the definitive interface in a cat catalyzing fertility exuding the contours and the fragrance of his open inclusive secular imagination ushering in certain modernist secular ethos this was ramanujan's way of celebrating cosmopolitanism that connects the linguistic formalism with the semiotics semantics which connect the agam and the puram as enunciated in sangam poetry as illustrated in his translation next rasas gunas of his cosmopolitanism the cosmopolitanism he was committed to as a person author scholar teacher translator has something to do with this innate taste rasas and gunas brought in in the ambience of mysore brahminical puritanism the places he travels located with both in india and abroad with his professional engagements and commitments served as matrices for practicing this cosmopolitan aesthetic 
his balanced context sensitivity evident in the translations which include interior landscape now poems from a classical tamil anthology speaking of shiva hymns for for the, for the drowning a flowering a flowering tree and other oral tales from india all these foreground intertextual influences coming from various sources especially non sanskrit indian regional literature sangam poetry for instance and establishes the complex sources and the resources of creativity and poetry and this is what the illustration that i am coming to this is way he translates nilatinum peride vaninum uyandanru neerinum aar alavinre saaral karungol kurunjippu kondu perundhen ilaikkum naadano natpe this is ever close to look at this translation next this is ekya bigger than the earth certainly higher than the sky more unfathomable than the water is this now or this man who is that man of the mountain slopes where bees make rich honey look at the quote text look at the context look at the agampuram communion from the flowers of the kurunji that is such a black bravity next look at the bravity and what does this bravity brings in for us bravity was the lifeline of the poetry of sangam people in terms of semiotic and semantic the tamil text cited above integrates the exterior analogy namely bees gathering honey from kurunji flowers at the mountain slopes and taking it to the mountain top with the logic of the interior thought the union of the two arts coming together from different places merging into one in such a fine rhetoric brevity that it is a fine illustration of intertextuality that i spoke of in the first part that paves the way for hermeneutics with multiple connotations what do we see in this translation beautiful things we see what are they yeah paradoxical nature of discursive space taking place in terms of the multiple intelligibility of the text as julia christova would say in terms of intertextuality diachrony transformed into synchrony beautifully done in the poem translation then what are the other beauties exuding in this the fragrance of literary excellences vis-a-vis -vis the power of imagination what we call karpanai the language of the rhetoric what we call sollarchi the use of analogy what we call the logic of inner thought ullure and then the technique of what is it? the technique of analogy omai omai and finally the logic of inner thought ullure and then one more added the technique of indirection dwani suggestion what we call in tamil iraichi iraichi i have already translated all these terms for you to properly you to read the indian tradition and to integrate them in your translation category in parenthesis i have a parody here and what is happening today in terms of peripherality and superficiality by so called modern post modern rather post modern poet reconstructing that kind of kadal that kind of love story and this is what the pulavar ramalingam in one of his patimandram spoke about reported and referred to one of the parody poems i came by cycle she called me anbe and cycle vandhen anbe endra cycle vandhen came by bike she called me atta i came by car karil vandhen she called me neerdan endrendrum in kanavar and i said after pass all these were hired and she responded ayyo anna this is the 
parody today, where all those Agam Pram traditions are dismantled, deconstructed, and we have come into that kind of peripherality. This is the danger that we should not indulge in, in terms of works of art, or translating works of art into reading literature. What is the focus that we need to contact? What does the poem, this translated poem, convey to us? The task of rendering the theme of love, the virgin's love, moving towards the black stack, the Gurunji, acting out by an analog of the virgin's progress from abstraction to experience. One is, this is the idiomatic connotation. The translated done by AKR in terms of conceptualization, style, presentation, similar to that of the original text, is a superb one for the way it ensures the structure of the language. The exterior, the moves from the earth, the sky, water, to the slopes, and all that, and then to the inner thought in terms of the lady's love as bigger than the earth, higher than the sky. That is the quintessence of the inner figural landscape of the Tamil poetic text that AKR brings in, in this uh, Sangam literature. Therefore, what is our responsibility to as a translator? And this is what AKR suggests to us. Skip over two slides and come to the third slide, please. Significant. Next slide. Yeah, significant ones. Yeah, previous one. Previous one. Yeah. So, if we look at his translations of selected classical bhakti poetry in Tamil or in Telugu or in Kannada, they all strike a fine balance, synchronic synthesis between source and target languages, between the author's interest and his own interest. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. A reading of, speaking of Shiva and two of his select essays, is there an Indian way of thinking? And 300 Ramayanas would vouchsafe and confirm such a perception that I am trying to explain to you. Yes. So, synergy, synergy from heterogeneous exercise. This is one important idea, principle, canon that we see from, we learn from Ekya. They ensure translation is a conscious heteroglossic exercise that can energize readers to discern the scintillating polyphony a great translate text can usher in without missing the or bypassing the inner logic of the original text. Such an exercise widens not only translators translating consciousness vis-a-vis -vis interlingual language system or interlingual synonymy to use the phrase of Ian Davy, another brilliant um, um, person that we must remember when we do translation work. So, what is AKR's response to fidelity? Fidelity to translation is one of the terms that we often use. AKR states with reference to Kamban's retelling of Valmiki's Ramayana. What? That an iconic fidelity to the original may be a great value in the West. But we in India, Asia, rejoice in the similarity, cherish the savor and savor the differences, as we see Kamban himself doing towards Sita's character, chastity, her purity of heart, or describing Ravana's attitude towards Sita, or even bringing Rama and um, um, what's that, uh, throwing Ambu at uh, Ravana. All these beauties are not seen in the original Sanskrit of Valmiki's Ramayana. This is the way Kamban rebuilds his Ramayana and that Ramayana today we go on reading, reading and the television shows goes into number of re-readings and today we have thousand, thousand, four thousand more Ramayanas including our own Ramayanas at home in the morning or in the evening between husband and wife, between son and father, between daughter and daughter, mother-in-law, all those are part of that kind of peripheral Ramayana that we have today. And AKR reminds us that practicing prospective translators may be reminded that, that AKR is not an imitator or follower of the Western metaphysics of translation. 
readers may be may remember Phyllis Miller's statement, namely, translation is a wandering existence in a perpetual exile. Wandering existence in a perpetual exile. A post Babel Babel crisis, which has an obsession with the quest for equivalence, a quest linked to the Christian theological concern vis-à-vis -vis paradise lost and paradise regained. So, what to him, to AKR, rasa matter, rasa and baba matter. That is the Bharata's shaping principle that gives the work of art original or translated text its distinctive quality, the aesthetic art emotion. Next, AKR's principles. What are those five principles that he enumerates in terms of as canons, as idioms, as rules, as principles, as guidelines for translators? One, author, translator, reader relationship to be maintained. Author, translator, reader relationship. All these mean four texts. Author's text, context, translator's text, and the attitude, his value system, his context, reader's text, four text coming together. All these have become part of the relational priming. And that's why I went into that. So all this would help us not to indulge in binary opposition, not to indulge in exaggeration and the indeterminacy of meaning, and not to indulge in autonomous or agentless textuality or intertextuality that tends to reject or ignore humanistic history. Guideline two. Translation involves a reader-sensitive cross-cultural transmission. A cross-cultural transmission. Intertextual work implied in the task of translation opens up a multi-track process. Is what I meant by the science term, scientific term, cosmos. In terms of cross-cultural transmission and expression, the author's source text needs to be transmitted in the context of contemporary reader. While taking a particular text from one culture to another, the translator also translates the reader from the second culture into the first one, keeping in mind the expectations of the reader. The reader expects the reliability of the representation and delight in the aesthetic pleasure. This is what AKR does in all his translations, including You Are Antamurti Samskara, written in 1965. Next, three. Socio-linguistic approach. Critiquing moving beyond the monolithic Sanskrit grammatology, Tamil Brahminical dialectics, AKR tries to legitimize a vast variety of non-script, non-Sanskrit, non-monolithic linguistic dialectics of India, which suits his linguistic innovation in the course of translating a text. This is what translators should adapt. This is adaptation. This is enculturation. This is enculturation. This is his way of responding to the expectations of various social groups among his readers in India and Indian diasporic readers outside India. This trust is abundantly clear in his essay, co-authored with White Bright, Socio-Linguistic Variation and Language Change. This is why AKR recommends phrase to phrase rather than word to word translation without losing the sight of the inner logic of the original. It suggests that Parallelism rather than complete equivalence is of significant value in terms of relationality between the source text and the transferred text. Next. Headline number four. Pragmatic and inclusive aesthetic approach. AKR was more focused on the back of the embroidery than the finished product. That's what I meant by osmotic process. The process matters rather than the end. Which, which will automatically make the product so beautiful, so elegant, so fascinating, which becomes the object of the reader's delight. Parts contribute to the whole. Parts are as fascinating as, as the whole. Buddha believed in that. Bhaktim believes in that, in terms of chronotype, time and space category. This explains his sense of pragmatism. This is AKR. His linguistic, formalistic approach cannot be separated from his pragmatic approach to art, Literature and culture. He insists more on the principles of construction, the process, 
rather than the product. The last, hyphenated cosmopolitan. This I have already explained. No language is pure. Yet, every language is potentially grammatical, grammatically a complete system. It's a very unique phenomenon in Tamil grammar. In the process of translation, what matters is the network of translation. The inner logistics, logics ingrained within the two languages, cultures of the text in question, ensure that irrationalities of external boundaries are overcome by the leap of imagination the translator is capable of. The leap of imagination the translator should possess. From this point of view, Jekyll felt home every felt home everywhere. She did not have problems like the post-colonial diasporic writers in terms of self-image, desire image, in terms of one leg here, one leg there, who write with their arms and roots, excellent memory with a prediction for resurrection. Yet the Indianness to which he was personally, professionally, aesthetically committed, never deserted him in his quest for constructive cosmopolitan. And this was the beauty of his ceaseless poetic experience. Next. Here again, I am bringing the latest book by Sivakami, the writer from Tamil Nadu, writing from the subaltern background, who facilitated the Emerald Publishers who have published this, this novel, the latest novel written in English. That is the language, the language, the language of the mirror. That's the latest novel by Sivagami, who has used often land as a as a puram metaphor in all her emotional outbursts in the aham of her novel. Elegantly printed and published by Emerald Publishers, Chennai. This novel of three three seven pages by Sivagami, written in English, sent to me for review for literary journal. It's an aesthetically organized book, woven with a number of intertextual crisscross things, not at all. I have interacted with Bama at Nagarwoyal. I have interacted with, uh, with uh, Sivagami. I was a moderator um, in Hyderabad, Central University of Hyderabad. And we, they, they have become friends. We have been in touch with. And this is the latest book that she has sent me for review. And this is one of the books that you can try attempt to do translation. And this is why I am bringing in that book into this context. I am reading, I am almost completing, but it's a book. Why I, I like this book is the author is an author's crystal clear imagination, intelligible communication. The book can be read at one go. The central character, Bhuvana, her inner turmoil is movingly captured through a number of Agam Puram chronotype in global space and time with Indian order in the context of a sojourn in a university town in the USA in search of totemic value in public, in the public and personal domain of our life. This is a summary of the book, the, the content of the book. The way the author historicizes episodes and events enables readers to see what it means to live in the midst of different nationalities, in the midst of white majority, or why, why cosmopolitan outlook in life matters for greater and finer human relationships beyond the particularities perpetuated in island and country. And this is what um, I and Devanur Mahadeva of that Kusma Bale, a famous Kannada subaltern writer, interacted. And I have written an article, on a, on a, on a long article on Devanur Mahadeva, the first one written in English, a long one. Um, uh, on Kusma Bale, I mean, it's available on the internet, it's available in a different book, in two, three books which are published as, as chapter. Reading this novel can prompt a discerning reader to translate it in Tamil or any other translated uh, target language. To conclude, next. Are you all with me? The times we live in are inclined towards intertextuality, polyphony, chronotropic sideward glancing. This is one summation. First part. 
an awareness of this fact calls for context sensitive relational striving vis a vis translation endeavors this is the second part agam from sangam and ekya ramanujam agam from affinities agam from affinities serving as agencies of inclusivity help us see the relevance of the unique ways of christian translation endeavors it is against this backdrop translators are urged to historicize contextualize and inculturate the original text and relocate it as a work of targeted text as akr does or did in his life and this is one of the pictures that i i and my lady we, we had we as a family we had been to the children we had been to kodaikanal and a program and this is what i see in that famous guha guna ke guna ke around that this was the three trees on the top little little flattened but below so many roots visible partly hidden partly visible all in like a brain wire interconnected interconnected so beautiful so beautiful and what these roots convey to me wiring in the brain with the left and right brain with left brain more beautifully functioning ladies than men there way that's why women female brains are more emotional number 2 the ecological perspective of and the human reasoning going together metaphorically via this route number 3 complex seeing with a number of chronotopic portion this is what um, um not bhakti other one the complex thing and one more the russian author who does that i i don't get his name immediately <coughs> i have written an article on him too and and a site at kodaikanal these roots and these roots r o t e s convey to us what the beauty of the third language next and this is what akr does brett brett is the author brett complexity brett akr approaches to translate and facilitate us to think like an ecologist who sees the value of boundaryless roots and roots consorting together beneath the soil and yet retaining their own uniqueness fragrance fruit bearing ability to the delight of onlookers and at the spirit of ecology strike at the penury of translators who may struggle to possess the sense of discernment to see the power and beauty of the presence of balanced context sensitive intuition what i call the third language guiding them the intuitive third language i mean here is the universal language audible to ecologists seers poets who think and see clearly like seers that transcends the differences and barriers and builds bridges of understanding between source language and the target language in the ambience of author translator rural relationship kept live by context sensitive translation such a notion requires another keynote address or a paper to be written thank you